Welcome to the History of North America. I'm Mark Vinette. In 1588, a large fleet of Spanish ships sailed to invade England. Spain's Catholic King Philip II was determined to remove Protestant Queen Elizabeth from the throne. The outcome of this epic sea battle greatly influenced the subsequent exploration, commercialization, settlement, and colonization of North America. Let's listen to In Our Times, Melvin Bragg and his guests discuss this pivotal event. On the 28th of May 1588, a fleet of 151 Spanish ships set out from Lisbon, bound for England. Its mission was to transport a huge invasion force across the Channel and assist in the overthrow of Elizabeth I. Two months later, this mighty Spanish armada was sighted off the coast of Cornwall. Palling weather, poor planning, and spirited English resistance defeated the Spaniards. After a brief battle, their battered fleet fled. What was the plan? How did the Spaniards calculate how many ships, what sort of ships, uh, and so on? A lot of debate about exactly how many ships even set sail from Spain and how big the fleet was, but estimates sort of suggest something in the region of 130 to 150 ships. The basis of the plan, really importantly, was this idea of rendezvousing with Palma in and around the Low Country. So, so that was the, the big idea. 30,000 um, of them. Yeah. And therefore, that completely dictated the way they sailed. They had to sail basically right along the south coast of England in order to rendezvous with Palmer's army. This was really tricky because actually the commander of the Armada, Medina Sidonia and Palmer, didn't have any contact with each other despite sending repeated messages that didn't get through for the entire duration of the Armada's voyage. So Medina Sidonia commanding the ships had no way of knowing where Palmer's army was, whether it was ready to embark. In fact, Palmer's army had been overtaken by illness and the sort of disasters that always happen to early modern armies massively reduced its size from the expectation that Medina Sidonia had. And moreover, they couldn't really find a sensible place to rendezvous because once they were traversing the south coast of England, the English fleet was in hot pursuit and they couldn't get to a deep water harbour safely and securely where they could rendezvous with Palmer. So the whole thing was based on a premise that turned out to be completely invalid. How long did it take Mir Rodriguez Salgado to put the fleet together? What sort of ships did he want for different purposes? He's got to pick up an army of 30,000 people. Mm -hmm. He's got to have fighting ships because he knows the British have got, English have got fighting ships. So how did he put it together? It was a very complex operation. Mm -hmm. um, he had his best soldiers fighting in the Low Countries and it was going to be a complete waste of time and money to bring them over from there to Spain. But he had his best ships in the Iberian Peninsula. One of the problems of this great empire is that its forces are scattered. And what he decides to do is to attack England, but for a very long time the nature of that attack remains open, remains up for grabs, and even the target is undecided. There's a lot of talk perhaps of attacking Ireland rather than going against England directly. But in the end, they come to the conclusion that the best thing is to send a large fleet from Spain that will act as a convoy and a defense shield for the army that will be put together in the Low Countries. And people think of the Armada as the main force, but it wasn't. This is an auxiliary force. What the majority of that fleet contains is a very large convoy that is carrying absolutely everything for the army that is in the Low Countries, which is going to be transported in very small boats. And so they're carrying food, they're carrying tents, they're carrying wooden spoons and bowls for the army. It's a huge convoy. And around that convoy, there is a relatively small group of first frontline vessels of fighting ships that are protecting it. That's why the Armada is so slow. That's why the Armada has to stay in a very tight formation throughout its voyage, because the majority of those ships are not fighting ships. And in the end, Philip II tries to get as many ships as he can. As with every early modern power, he does not have very many ships of his own. What they do, Elizabeth does the same, when there is a crisis or a war, you simply embargo or impound all the good quality ships that happen to be in your ports. And you make adjustments to them, and then they are incorporated into your navy. Tight formation, what was the formation? It was in a sort of half moon with the majority of the ships in the middle surrounded by these larger and much better armed ships that both protected them but also, when necessary, broke off to tackle the English fleet. 
there was a kind of outer perimeter wall formed by the actual gun warships around the weaker ships in the centre. Can you give us some idea of the comparisons between the Spanish and the English fleet? Well, Queen Elizabeth had, and some of her subjects had as well, a small number of very powerful warships of a new class. The English had specialised in trying to combine two things which were pretty new at sea. The first was carrying very heavy battering guns, and the second was what we call the ship rig, a really effective, powerful, fast sailing rig. And they'd got quite a lot further than the Spaniards had with this. The Spaniards, on the whole, were in the business of open ocean navigation, which they were practically a hundred years ahead of the English. Hardly anybody in the English fleet had experienced a deep sea navigation, whereas the Spaniards had been crossing the Atlantic, obviously, ever since the discovery, almost a hundred years before. They'd been running big convoys across the Atlantic for 40 years. They were deeply experienced in all this kind of thing, but what they were essentially in the business of was armed convoy escorts, whereas the English were in the business of attacking and had built up this small but impressive force of powerful ships. The Queen's ships probably the most powerful of all for defensive purposes, but some of her subjects, of course, with rather smaller but also powerful ships, using them for aggressive and profit-making war in the Atlantic. So can you give us some idea of the numbers involved? What did the English have? After it was all over, the Elizabethan government actually produced an official list of all the ships which it thought had taken some share in the campaign, and it's 197, ranging from the biggest warship down to a tiny pinnace called the Pippin. But they certainly weren't all there at the same time, and many of these were very small ships, essentially in auxiliary roles. In terms of serious fighting ships, there were probably 30 or 40. So the Armada set off in May 1588. It's, it's going to be a long voyage. Briefly, Diane, what happened between then and when it reached the English Channel? They had a series of minor disasters. One kind of storm hit them so badly that Medina Sidonia actually wrote to Philip to say, Do you, are you sure God really blesses our voyage? Do you think we should call it off now? Because you know, we've just been struck by a wind and probably God sent it. They finally made it to Ushant on the 29th of July, and that's quite slow going. Ushant is the last of France, the northwest tip of France, it's an island, um, belongs to Brittany, and it's also the gateway to the English Channel. So it was really a slog even just to get up from the Spanish ports as far as Ushant. And it also meant that every intelligencer in Europe knew they were coming. Everybody had seen them. They were finally sighted in the Channel on the 30th of July, and Drake had watchers all along the Channel. This is something that everybody will know about the beacons. They lit the Lizard Beacon on the 30th of July, and the messenger duly head off to Plymouth to tell Drake that the beacon had been lit. Drake was delighted because this was his plan coming beautifully into effect. It had been his risky strategy to put those relatively few English fighting ships at Plymouth rather than putting them in the narrow part of the channel adjacent to the Low Countries, which is what some campaigners had wanted him to do. His bet had been that the Spanish would come along the coast, that they would arrive in the west first, and that he, Drake, could therefore get the weather gauge, could kind of trap them almost. So this he duly did. They then had to welter their way out of Plymouth Harbour on an ebb tide, which is not too easy, and that's why he had time to finish that famous game of bowls, unless that's a complete myth, but it's why he would have had time. He would have had ages to finish a game of bowls while they sort of mucked about. They manoeuvred and they got the weather gauge. They got to windward of the Spanish fleet, and that placed them absolutely ideally just where you want to be in a naval battle behind the enemy, and this they duly did. They had a totally different set of tactics to the Spanish, and the Spanish were actually horrified, we have records to say this, at what the English did. The English formed into a long line, broadside on to the Spanish, which Spanish tactics said, you must never do, you must absolutely be face on to the enemy. Because the Spanish way was to try to close with a ship, board it, and thus take it. The English way was to use this terrific ordinance that they had on the race ships, this terrific cannon fire to destroy the enemy ships. Who was in charge on the British side? Who was doing the planning? Well, ultimately, the Queen and her council are in charge, and they are taking the major strategic decisions, certainly on the disposition of the fleet. The actual commander-in-chief of the fleet is the Lord Admiral of England, Lord Howard of Effingham, and Drake is his second in command, one of a number of experienced seamen who advise him. They don't all agree, and Howard, though he's a less experienced seaman than the rest of them, is there, amongst other things, to be the man who takes the ultimate decision and listens to the advice.
By this point, he'd been converted to Drake's argument that since the prevailing winds blow up the channel from the southwest, mm. in order to command the situation, the English needed to be down at the mouth of the channel. Otherwise, there was a grave risk that the Spaniards might land in the West Country, which they had been known to have been thinking of doing in the past. The key people on each side. We've heard about uh, Medina Sidonia. He wasn't the first choice, was he? And then we've heard about Francis Drake. Can we just elaborate on these? Yes, the original commander for the fleet was the Marquis of Santa Cruz, but he had died in February of 1587. He was an extremely experienced seaman, ideal uh, commander for this type of force, and he had also fought in the Azores and combined an amphibious operation. However, once he died, he was very rapidly replaced by the Duke of Medina Sidonia, who was also highly experienced. He had been putting together the defensive squadrons for the Indies. He was a very high-ranking aristocrat, and those were the two crucial criteria that you needed for somebody to command that fleet. So this myth that he got seasick and that he was hopeless and he knew nothing about the sea is just that, a myth. He was a deal commander because of his status, because of his capacity to organize a navy, and his capacity to enforce obedience. How strong was Howard's command? What you have at the head of both the naval forces and the military forces are nobles, high-ranking nobles. And what you have below them are experts or members of the lower nobility who have much more practical technical exercise. Now, both uh, Howard of Effingham and Medina Sidonia depend on these naval experts and these military experts to advise them. But they take the decision and they get the wrong decision and they're all used to this. Now, what we have in the two navies, though, is a different level of authority and obedience. In the case of the Spanish fleet, those below Medina Sidonia obeyed his orders. He had a habit of hanging anybody who didn't, so it had the right effect, let's put it that way. So there was never an issue of disobedience. The lower level commanders of the fleet obeyed orders and kept to them. In the case of the English fleet, this wasn't the case. Drake and some of the others were used to acting on their own. And there is this famous incident quite early on in the crisis, if we can call it that, where two Spanish ships had been damaged. One of them got left behind and Drake simply abandons the English fleet and goes back to take the prize. Now that does not happen at all in the Spanish fleet. But in many ways, there are sort of similarities between them. Next time, we recount the climactic conclusion of the Spanish Armada. I'm Mark Vinette, and I hope you're enjoying the ride.